preach though this morning a, uh, a topical yet again, and uh, we'll start here in Luke chapter 24. So if you can find that, Luke 24, and I'll start reading in verse 46, all the way towards the end there, Luke 24, verse 46. Uh, this passage is uh, on the tail end of uh, this account where Jesus, after his resurrection, uh, meets with two of his disciples, and they were confused. They didn't know who he was. And uh, in verse 45, it says uh, that after he had spoken with them and had eaten with them, verse 45, it says, then he opened their understanding that they might understand the Scriptures. Oh, that God would do that for us today. Verse 46, And He said to them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in His name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem, and ye are witnesses of these things. And behold, I send the promise of my Father unto you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. Let's pray. Father, we ask that you would guide us this morning. Help us to understand the verses that we'll be looking at. And Lord, in this uh, topical message, we pray that we'd get a, a good round view of this doctrine of repentance. And we pray that we would, uh, we would look for ways that we need to apply it to our own lives. Lord, if there is someone here this morning that has not repented and turned to you and had faith in Jesus Christ for salvation, May today be that day. Lord, for the Christian that is in need of repentance this morning, I pray that you would work in hearts and lives. Show us, guide us, lead us. And we pray that you would be magnified through your word as we study it today. In Christ's name, amen. Well, in this passage, we see Jesus giving uh, the, the Great Commission uh, it's recorded for us through all of the Gospels and, in fact, in Acts as well. And something that Jesus says here as recorded by Luke is, I think, important for us and sometimes missed in our teaching and preaching in Gospel-centered churches in America. Jesus commanded His disciples that, as it says in verse 47, repentance and remission of sins should be preached in His name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem, and ye are witnesses of these things. There's an emphasis here on repentance. Now, I love the fact that we are saved by grace through faith, and that doesn't change. That's been the same since the first sin, Adam and Eve. Uh, and, and that will not change. We are saved by the grace of God. We appropriate that by faith, trusting in the promise of God that He would send a deliverer or that He did send a deliverer. And now we know that deliverer as Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, our Savior, the one who died on the cross for our sins, His blood was shed, paying the death penalty that I deserve and that you deserve. And we replace our faith in Him, our dependence on that complete sacrifice once for all, when we trust in Him by faith, we receive everlasting life, God gives us forgiveness, and we are His, and we are made right with Him. But there is an accompanying doctrine of repentance that paves the way for faith in the Lord Jesus Christ that we must be aware of and we must preach and we must help others to understand. There's a reason why God sent John the Baptist to prepare the way for Jesus the Messiah. And John the Baptist preached in the wilderness. And John the Baptist was baptizing people. 
with the baptism of repentance, they were making decisions that what I'm doing is wrong. The direction I'm going is the wrong way. I need to turn toward God. I need what He has to offer. And only then, when a person turns from themselves, from their sin, and turns to God, can they be in a place where they can accept by faith the promise of Jesus Christ and the salvation offered through His blood. And so we've got to understand this repentance is a crucial message in a gospel-preaching church and a gospel-preaching message at all. There must be the inclusion of repentance. Jesus told us right there in His great commission that we should be preaching repentance to all nations. Uh, Well, we... We see that his disciples who were listening to him got the message. And in fact, they did preach repentance. Let's turn ahead to Acts chapter 2. In Acts chapter 2, we see the the beginning of the church age. Here in Acts chapter 2, with the, the day of Pentecost, as Peter stands up and preaches a message concerning Jesus Christ. He's preaching to these Jewish people and proselytes who had embraced some of the truth revealed in Scripture, but they had rejected Jesus Christ. And perhaps it could be that many of those that Peter was preaching to on the day of Pentecost had actually been in the crowd crying out, Crucify Him! Rejecting Jesus Christ. And so here now, Peter stands up and preaches this bold message about Jesus Christ and in fact points the finger at them and saying, you're the one that have crucified Him. Well, here at the end of the message, they are so shaken to the core at hearing the truth of the gospel, hearing the truth of who Jesus was, as they understood the resurrection, bore testimony to the fact that He was, in fact, God in the flesh. They were shaken to the core, and their response was, what shall we do? They knew they were in trouble. They knew they were in trouble. They knew they had sinned against God. They knew that the wrath of God was hanging over them. And so they asked Peter, what shall we do? And so we find it here in verse 37. When they had heard this, They were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of of the Holy Ghost, for the promises unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Peter preaches a message of repentance. He, in essence, tells them, you are going the wrong direction, and it is time for you to turn around and embrace the truth. Embrace Jesus Christ. You must repent in order to do that. See, repentance accompanies faith in Jesus Christ. And you cannot have one without the other. The apostle Peter preached that message, but it wasn't just Peter. The Apostle Paul preached it as well. Look ahead at Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17. As we see this message of repentance, the Apostle Paul is sharing his testimony and he's defending himself and his ministry. And in chapter 17, look down with me at uh, verse number, let's start in verse 30. Verse 30. He says, In the times of this ignorance God winked at, as he's preaching now to, uh, to these uh, uh, Gentiles, he says, The times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. That's what, that's what the, the Apostle Paul now is preaching, and he's, he's sharing with them, you must 
repent. You've been pursuing after false gods. You've been pursuing after yourself and your own desires and your own flesh. It is time now to turn from sin, turn from yourself, turn to God and embrace the truth of the gospel. God has commanded, that's what it says here, the Apostle Paul saying this, God has commanded all men everywhere to repent. Well, if Peter preached it, if Paul preached it, and if Jesus said we ought to preach it, I wonder what we should do. (laughs) Do we have to think about that? No. Let's go ahead and preach repentance. What is repentance? There have been a lot of books written about repentance. A lot of theologians have talked about it and discussed it. And and a lot of people have a lot of different opinions about it. And and some people, depending on what their perspective is and, and what their particular doctrinal persuasion is, they may come up with some pretty interesting definitions. I think it would be best for us just to look at the Bible and see what God's Word says. Now, there's, there's nothing wrong, and I think it's important and helpful to look at what other great men of the faith have written about it. It's good for us to check out uh, some commentaries and, and read through these things, but our allegiance is always to the Word of God because this topic of retent, repentance uh, is, is, is a big one, and, and there's some uh, just different perspectives, almost controversial uh, perspectives, on this topic of repentance. But it is clear, it is clear uh, that the Bible says we ought to preach repentance. Repent simply means to turn. Simply means to turn. And depending on the context of the situation, we can see what that may be. Uh, In fact, the Bible tells us that God has repented. Now that's an interesting thought, isn't it? Uh, In fact, in the in the, uh, the book of Exodus where the children of Israel were sinning against God and, and there was judgment coming. God was going to rain down judgment on His people and Moses interceded for the people. He prayed for the people and the Bible says that God repented. It simply means that He turned. He changed His mind on what He was going to do. Now, that's, that's an anthropomorphism on, on God. I mean, God is not human. God doesn't learn anything new. Oh, that's new. I guess I'll change my mind. That's not God's perspective, okay? God knows everything. Uh, He is sovereign. He is in control of everything. But you know, when you and I change, then God's response to us changes. And in that sense, God changes. God repents. Uh, It's almost as though... Uh, You could think of it this way. God responds to sinners in one way and responds to His righteous in in another way. And when you move from this category to that category, you place yourself in another uh, way of, of, of response from God. And so God, in that sense, changes even though He Himself is the changeless one. Okay, does that make sense? But for you and I, uh, we certainly change. We learn things. We make different decisions. And you learn something and think, boy, you know what? I think I'm going to do something different. Because it didn't go so well last time that I I did whatever it was. And so you change your mind and you change your actions. We could define repentance as a radical change of mind and heart that results in a change of action. It's a radical change in the way that you think. It's a radical change in the way that you think in your heart. It's a change in the direction that you go. And that radical change in your mind and heart turns into actions. Actions is not the repentance. But the the change of mind, the change of heart is the repentance. And it bears itself out in actions. In fact, let's look at Acts chapter 26, and we can see kind of a definition here. In Acts chapter 26, Paul here, uh, preaching about his, speaking about his own ministry and how he was uh, ministering to those that were saved and those that were unsaved. Here he says in Acts chapter 26, verse number 20, let's look at that one. He's defending himself before King Agrippa. He says, um, uh, verse 19 for the context, Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision, 
God had told him what to do. This is what he did now in obedience, verse 20. But showed first unto them of Damascus and at Jerusalem and throughout all the coasts of Judea and then to the Gentiles that they should repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance. I think that's a pretty good definition right there. That they should repent, now to define it, that is, turn to God. That's the repentance, turning to God. And then what accompanies that turning to God? It says, and to do works meet or suitable, appropriate for repentance. Do works meet for repentance. There are accompanying actions that go along with the change of mind and heart that repentance is. And so repentance, you could define it, a radical change of mind and heart that results in a change of actions. Now some would say, well, Pastor Joel, you're, you're turning a salvation into some works-based thing. As though you've got to be clean from all your sin, you've got to turn from all your sin in order to be saved. You've got to clean your life up, and then and only then can you trust Jesus Christ and get saved. No, my friend, that is not what the Bible teaches. But any person who trusts Jesus Christ as their Savior is born of the Spirit. There is a mind change that takes place. There is a difference in the way that you think. Where you used to be going this way, now you've decided, wait a minute, wait a minute. Because of what I've learned of who God is and what He's done for me, because I've learned about who I am and what I've done, it is time to change. And you turn to God. And then there's those accompanying works that come with that, see. And so you turn to God and in faith embrace the gospel of Jesus Christ. Repentance is a response to the divine act of God. It is God that does this work and you respond to it. Let's look at some more verses. 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy and chapter 2. And I know I got you hopping around a lot, which is uh, not typical for my messages, unless it's the summertime, right? 2 Timothy chapter 2. And uh, let's look at verse number 24. 2 Timothy 2, verse 24. The servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient. In meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. If God, peradventure, will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, who are taken captive by him at his will. Do you know, any time a person trusts Jesus Christ as their Savior, any time a person repents and turns to him and receives in faith the Lord Jesus Christ, any time that happens, it is a miracle. It is the divine act of God that enables that to happen. God speaks to your heart. God reveals Himself to you and gives you this choice, gives you this opportunity. And by faith, you turn and you take. By faith, you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. And so this is the act of God. This is the gift of God. And we see it there, the servant of the Lord. Here you are. You want to help other people trust Jesus Christ? You want to help other people recover themselves out of the snare of the devil? Well, you're gentle unto all. You're apt to teach. You're patient. You're meekly instructing others because you know that you're, the, you're a sinner just as they are. And so you meekly instruct them because you are praying that God, in His wisdom, will give them repentance. That God will speak to their hearts. That God will do something in their hearts, in their souls, by the work of His Holy Spirit, convicting them of sin, of judgment, of righteousness. That God will convict them and give them repentance. That they will turn to Him and embrace the gift of Jesus Christ. 
That's what you're praying for. Nobody wrestles anybody else into getting saved. You know, we have, uh, we have our vacation Bible school, and we love to share the gospel with kids. And kids are just wide-eyed, and they're open, and they're, they're learning, and they're excited to hear it, and they want to know the truth. Do you know, it would be so easy for us to just twist their arms and say, hey, you need to come down here. You need to pray this prayer. You need to say these words. You need to do these things, and then you're saved. You know, it would be so easy for us to do that. But that's not how people get saved. They don't get saved when we do something. They don't get saved when they pray something. They get saved when God's Holy Spirit convicts them, and they respond to that. They respond in repentance and faith. So Pastor Joel, you know, I've been in a Christian home all my life and honestly, I just don't know about this repentance thing because I've grown up doing good. I mean, I've grown up doing the right things. Listen, if you're saved, there's a time in your life where you've realized even though my actions may have been right, my heart sure hasn't been. And in my mind and in my heart, I've been going the wrong way. And I know it. And I need Jesus Christ. I need to turn to Him. I need to embrace Him. I need to stop fighting against mom and dad. I need to stop fighting against the authority over me. I need to stop fighting against God and His Word. I need to stop fighting against what I'm learning in church, what I'm hearing in the preaching. I need to stop fighting against the Holy Spirit of God who has been wrestling with me. And it is time for me to turn to God. Yeah, maybe you have grown up in a Christian home and you've done a lot of good things. But you still need to repent, let me tell you. And you won't get saved until you do. When you turn to God and then, by faith, embrace the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so here, uh, the Apostle Paul, instructing Timothy, says, we're praying for people that God would give them repentance. Because repentance is a response to the divine act of God. God has to give it. And God does give it. Let's look at a couple more passages in Acts. Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 5. So back up there to Acts. And what a great book, Acts. Uh, Just the foundation for the New Testament church. And, and it's a book of transition. God lays out this time of transition between this, the, the gospel era where Jesus was on the earth and, and, uh, and that offering the kingdom to now the church age. Here in Acts, uh, we see some amazing things. Chapter 5, verse 29. Chapter 5 and verse 29. Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom ye slew and hanged on a tree. Him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior for to give repentance to Israel and the forgiveness of sins. You see, God's act of grace in giving repentance to Israel is also God's act of grace in giving His Son Jesus to die for their sins on the cross. And so Jesus provides them now the opportunity to turn to God and embrace Him. They are given repentance. They are given this opportunity. Now this verse here says that He's given uh, to, to give repentance to Israel. That is the Jewish people. That doesn't mean that every single Jewish individual has embraced God and repented and turned to Him. But they have been given this opportunity to repent and turn to Him. We see the same thing as said for the Gentiles. Look with me at Acts chapter 11. Acts chapter 11. Let's look at verse number 18. This is after Peter had had preached at Cornelius' house and and he's talking about uh, this incredible experience where Gentiles were getting saved. And in verse number 18 of Acts chapter 11, it says, When they heard these things, they held their peace and glorified God, saying, Then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. (laughs) Amen Amen to that. (laughs) And as Gentiles, we're thankful for that. You see, God has given now, 
through Jesus Christ and through the ministry of His Holy Spirit, the convicting work of His Holy Spirit, God has granted repentance unto life to the Gentiles. And you and I have the opportunity to repent and respond to God and embrace Jesus Christ. But we must turn. We must turn. If you would claim to be a Christian and your life has never changed, then there is cause for us perhaps to doubt whether you've truly repented. Because repentance is a radical change of mind and heart that results in a change of actions. No, you don't earn it. You don't work for salvation. But when you get saved, God changes your life. God changes your life. And there is a dramatic change. Again, you might say, Pastor Joel, I, you know, I, I've been acting right most of my life. I don't know that there's this dramatic change. Oh, in your heart, there is a dramatic change when you repent. Because now, instead of grudgingly obeying, grudgingly doing, oh, I have to go to church again because I'm supposed to. Instead of grudgingly pulling out your Bible and reading, I know that I'm supposed to, and out of obedience I will. No, there comes a point where you've repented and turned to God, and now you want to. You want to. You want to trust Him. You want to serve Him. You want to read His Word. You want to worship with His people. There is a heart change. And so from the inside out, God makes this dramatic change in your life. It's called repentance. And you need to repent because God has commanded all men everywhere to repent. Repent. It is time for us to repent. Repentance is, is a part of salvation uh, there is repentance and faith. In Acts chapter 20, uh, we see this. I think, did we look at this earlier? No, we didn't. Okay, look at Acts chapter 20 with me. <clears throat> Verse number 21. <clears throat> the Apostle Paul, again, he says, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. You see how that works together? Repentance toward God, that's repentance from dead works, from the old you, from the sins that you've committed, from, from all that you used to be. Repentance from that to God. And now, faith toward Jesus Christ. That's salvation. And so the two go hand in hand. You see it as well in Hebrews chapter 6. There is repentance from dead works to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And you can check that out in Hebrews chapter 6 verse 1 sometime. Uh, but you see the, the two go hand in hand. There must be a turning. There must be repentance. Now if there is repentance, if there truly is in your heart a change, a change, a dramatic and radical change of mind and heart that turns to God. It will result in a change of actions. There must be and there will be works meet for repentance. Let me review that verse again we saw in Acts 26 and verse 20. And you may want to uh, just keep this in your brain. Uh, the works meet or suitable for the repentance that's already taken place in your heart. In Acts 26 and verse number 20, again, we read it before, but let me show it to you again. But showed first unto them of Damascus and Jerusalem and throughout all the coasts of Judea and then to the Gentiles that they should repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance. This reminds me of the ministry of John the Baptist. John the Baptist was preaching in the wilderness and people would come out to see him. Uh, this weird looking guy, you know, I don't know what he looked like, but he's got, uh, he's eating locusts and honey and, and uh, strange diet, strange clothes. And, and here he is out there preaching in the wilderness. People came out just to see a sight. And when they came out, God spoke to their hearts and, uh, and he would preach and say, you need to do works, meet for repentance. They'd say, what do we need to do? And he gave them specific instructions. 
You know, he told the Pharisees what to do. He told the soldiers what to do. He gave them specific instructions. This is the direction of your life now. If you truly have a heart change, you won't do those things anymore. Your life is going to be different. We sang in Sunday school, things are different now. Something happened to me. I think I started that a little high. <clears throat> when I gave my heart to Jesus, right? That things are different. There is repentance. And so there's, there are works meet for repentance in 2 Corinthians chapter 7 now. And, uh, and I've got to wrap it up with this passage. 2 Corinthians chapter 7. We see some evidences of repentance that I think are so rich. And I would challenge you to dig into this passage sometime and examine your heart and life and see if there is evidence, if there's fruit, if there's work, meet for repentance or suitable for repentance in your life. 2 Corinthians chapter 7. The Apostle Paul has written this letter. He wrote 1 Corinthians to correct the church with egregious sin that they had been committing. Well, they corrected their actions. They repented of their sin. The Apostle Paul writes the second letter, 2 Corinthians, to them and, and shows them that, that he's pleased with what they've done. And here he shows it in verse number 9 of 2 Corinthians chapter 7. Now I rejoice, not that ye were made sorry, but that ye sorrowed to repentance. For ye were made sorry after a godly manner, that ye might receive damage by us in nothing. There's a difference, by the way, between remorse, between sadness, between um, some kind of, of just uh, change in your actions. There's a difference between that and true repentance that comes from the heart. There's a godly sorrow that works repentance. There's a, there's a worldly sorrow that just maybe makes a change in your actions, but doesn't change anything in your relationship to God. There are lots of good people who have changed their lives dramatically. Oh, they find themselves in some kind of addiction. They find themselves drinking and, and, and stuck in that addiction, but, but they are able by self-will and determination and with the support and help of other people, they're able to change their actions. And to that we say, wonderful. But perhaps their relationship with God has never changed at all. So there's a godly sorrow that works repentance, that changes our hearts, changes our attitude towards God Himself. And so here he says, I'm glad that you sorrowed, not after a worldly sorrow, but after a godly sorrow. Manner. Verse 10, for godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. I want you to notice in that verse it says, godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of. Remember, repentance in its most basic definition is change or turn. And so he says, this godly sorrow has worked a repentance, a change, a turning in you to turn to God. Not to be repented of. Not to be turned away from. Okay? So this repentance, if it's true godly repentance, this repentance is permanent. It's permanent. Well, that doesn't mean there aren't times in our lives where we slip into the flesh and we sin against God and we must turn back to Him and confess that sin and get right. Oh, yes, that happens often. But this godly sorrow works a repentance in us that when God's Holy Spirit reveals to us, oh, you are wrong. Oh, we have such a desire to make it right that we will quickly and we will with urgency turn back to God and repent. You see, this repentance is not to be repented of. It's permanent. It sticks. It sticks. Is your repentance permanent? Let's look at a couple of other things. Verse 11. I'm sorry, ver yeah, verse 11. For behold, this self-same thing that ye sorrowed after a godly sor sorrow. What carefulness it wrought in you. That's a diligence. That's a paying attention to. You know, when you repent... In your heart, you give your attention to this. And you, and you say, you know what? This deserves my attention. This deserves uh, some action. And I will give myself to this. What carefulness it wrought in you. Yea, what clearing of yourselves. An interesting uh, word here. Seems to be this verbalizing or uh, a, a desire to make it known to others. 
I want everybody to know that I have repented, that I have turned. And so the things I used to do, I don't do them anymore. There's a change in my life, and I want everybody to know it. By the way, baptism, we'll have a baptism service tonight. Baptism is a picture of repentance. What I used to be, I am no longer. Just as Jesus died, so I am alive now in Him, and my life is is different. I walk in newness of life. It's a picture of repentance. And so you, you want to show and display to the whole world what I used to be. I no longer am. I have repented and turned to the Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior. Repentance. There's a clearing. There's an indignation. It says, what clearing of yourselves? What indignation? This is a, a displeasure at sin. When God's Holy Spirit points it out to you again, you say, oh, I don't want that. I don't want that. I'm sick of my sin. I'm sick of this who I used to be. I don't want that anymore. There's there's an intense displeasure when your repentance is true. A displeasure at sin. An indignation. Yea, what fear. Yes, fear. That's alarm. Oh no, I don't want that. Oh, I know where that took me before, and I don't want to go there again. I don't want the punishment that's coming with that. I don't want the consequences. I'm alarmed at this. I don't want to be in this mess. There's an alarm that comes with true repentance. Yea, what, uh, what, ve- uh, what indignation, what fear, what vehement desire. It's a longing to be clean. Boy, you can read about that in, uh, in Psalm 51. There's David. Oh, he wants to be clean. Lord, cleanse me. Make me pure again. I've spent too much time in the filth of my sin and of this world. Lord, make me clean. Make me pure. This vehement desire, a longing for cleansing. What zeal, a passion for change. Boy, I used to be passionate to live for myself and live the old way. Not anymore. Man, I'm all about Jesus Christ. I'm all about living for God. I'm all about my passion for Him. He's my whole world. It's all about Him. That's true repentance, a zeal. And then we see uh, revenge. Revenge. This is a retribution. Boy, if I can change the pain that I've caused, if I can help others, you know, I'm going to get back at the devil. And, uh, And by the grace of God, I'm going to redeem that time. And all that mess of my life that it would, what it was. No, I'm turning it, I'm turning it for him, and God will use it for his glory. And so this, this revenge, this retribution, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pay off those debts. I'm gonna, I'm gonna apologize to those who I'm who I've harmed. I'm gonna turn back to God and And I want to see those negative consequences turn into good ones, and I'm going to give myself over to the Lord Jesus Christ and serve Him with everything that I've got. That is true repentance. And that is what is needed in the church in America today. We we are so settled and comfortable in our lives as Christians, in this Christian nation, that we don't even think there needs to be a change in our lives. But God demands it. God is longing for your repentance. In fact, the Bible says, and we close in this in 2 Peter 3. In 2 Peter chapter 3, let's look at this verse and then we'll close. The Bible says of of God's desire. Chapter 3, verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. You know, God is waiting for you. He's waiting for you. He's longing for you. His Holy Spirit is pleading with you even now. Turn to me. Come to me. Let me change your life. Let me bless you. Let me give you righteousness. Let me give you all those things that you want and are trying to find without me.
just turned. He is waiting. He's long-suffering. But there is coming a time when that will run out. That time will run out. And the Bible says God will not always strive with man. There is an end to that. And I don't know when that is. Is that today? You know, when Jesus comes back, that's, that's the end. But you know, there's a time when God's Holy Spirit says, I've, I've worked with you and I've tried, but you don't want it. And that's it. And when God perhaps with, withholds and withdraws from you repentance, and then it is too late. I plead with you and I beg you, turn to him today. Repent and turn to him. Our Father, thank you for granting us repentance. We thank you for your grace and that gift of Jesus Christ and the gift of the Holy Spirit that sends conviction on our hearts even now. And Lord, I pray that today, those in need of turning to you would do so. That we would repent of our sin, repent of our selfish ways, turn to you wholly, and accept the redemption in Christ. For that unsaved person, Lord, today, convict their heart, help them to turn. And for that saved person, may today be the start of of a new life yet again as they turn back to you. We pray these things in the precious name of Jesus, our gracious God, our loving Savior. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.